Doug Ford's government promised and delivered on its election pledge to cancel the cap-and-trade program brought in by the previous government. This week, Ontario's financial accountability officer issued his report on what that's going to mean for the province's coffers. He is Peter Weltman, and he joins us now for more. Nice to have you here. It's great to be here. How long have you been on the job now? Uh, six months. Okay, so yeah. your visit is long overdue. I'm, long, I'm settled in. I, I don't want to <clears> assume, <throat> actually, that everybody knows what you actually do for a living. So can we start by just having you tell us what the Financial Accountability Officer's mission is? The mission of the Financial Accountability Officer is to provide independent, impartial, and uh, <clears throat> authoritative analysis to the legislators, so to the members of provincial parliament, about the government's financial situation, uh, cost of government programs, the, when I say financial, I mean the fiscal situation, so the government's budget going forward, and general trends in Ontario's economy. So it's a bit of a truth in advertising exercise? It's a truth in advertising. It's a, that's a great way to describe it. It's a truth in advertising exercise. <laughs> and, and another clarification, you don't work for the government, you work for the entire legislature. I work for the legislature. That's exactly right. So the legislative branch, the branch that is accountable to hold the government to account, accountable to the people that voted them in. So, I mean, that's, I think, an important distinction to make. You don't yes. report to the government. No. Nope. You report to everybody. <clears throat> that's right. Okay. Yeah, I have Go 124 on. bosses. <laughs> All the MPPs in there, right. And, in fact, the, the report we're about to talk about was requested by one of the opposition members, right? That's right. Was Andrea Horvath, the exactly. leader of the opposition, who yeah. asked you to look into this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, once upon a time, she said, Peter, can you please look at what the cancellation of the cap-and-trade program will mean to the province's bottom line? Yeah. And your... Prime findings were what? Our prime findings were fairly basic that <clears throat> because of the cancellation of the program, the revenues that the program were bringing in have disappeared, obviously. The expenditures that were being funded by those revenues haven't all disappeared. There's still three billion of those left. So effectively, what we found was it was going to add three billion dollars over four years to the budget deficit or the budget balance of the government. So promise made, promise kept to eliminate cap and trade, but expensive at the end of the day. Well, we don't. I think. I think. Let's get back to the to the role a little bit here. So I'm I'm a referee. Okay, our team is a referee. We call them as we see them. We don't make judgments. We try to keep the adjectives out of the report. So what it is is a cancellation of a program, eliminating the revenues of that program, and not eliminating all of the expenditures. Whether it's expensive or not expensive is somebody else to decide. So you're not going to tell us whether you think it was a, a good idea or a bad Absolutely. idea to I cancel cap and trade? Completely agnostic to that. But That's why we elect MPPs. They're the ones that have to make those decisions. So they make that value judgment, and you just say, you, having made that decision, here's what it's going to cost. That's right. Okay. Well, let's put the numbers up. <coughs> Sheldon, you want to bring that first graph up? Here is the impact on the Ontario budget of ending the cap-and-trade program, which was, I think, bringing about $2 billion annually into provincial coffers. That's is right. that right? That's right. Almost, right. Now, take us through this, because <coughs> you can see this is all obviously red ink, and it mm -hmm. is over a four-year period. So take us through what these numbers say. So what these numbers say is that after eliminating the revenues, there's still $841 million dollars of net expense that's going to head out in this uh, in this year 2018-19 now a chunk of that is a wind down program so okay. there's about 600 million of that used to wind down some of the existing spending programs these are programs that people have applied for grants or whatever the case may be maybe to buy an electric vehicle to retrofit their house or whatever the case is and the government hasn't cut those off immediately they've said okay you've made your commitment you can finish it off and we'll, the program will last as long as it takes for you to finish whatever you, were, you started. But that will cost something? <clears throat> There's obviously no revenue coming in Bingo. to cover it. That's right. All right. It's so that simple. Yeah. That, therefore, in the red. And if you add up those expenditures over the four-year period, you've you got to totaling about $3, $3 About $3 billion. That's okay. right. Uh, do, you, do you know why they have decided to keep some of the spending going despite cutting off the revenue channel? <laughs> I presume they figured that, that there was something there they wanted to keep. I have no idea, no way of knowing that. Okay. Yeah. Let us then go to the next graph, which is, that's what it means for the bottom line of the province. That's right. Here's what it means for the bottom <clears throat> line of each household, on average, in the province. And again, a lot of bars here, so we're going to take our time and go through this so you can explain what it all yeah. means. Yeah. The red bars and the dark bars mean two different things. Take us through it. <clears throat> okay. So this is a little different than the previous graph. This is the assumption that the program remains in place. So the red bars 
are the, in, the costs, the extra costs or incremental costs, as we like to say in finance land, mm -hmm. on, in, on households, on the average household, under each of the two programs. So and that's dollars, $264 dollars dollars per year. So exactly. Per so household. if cap and trade remained in place, households would, be ex would, would expect to incur in this year 264 extra dollars, next year 280, et cetera, up to $312 in extra costs that would have been passed along to them. By the province's cap and trade plan. By the province's cap and trade plan, okay. exactly. So the dark bars reflect what? The dark bars reflect the federal government's plan for provinces that choose not to enact a, a, a green energy program or any sort of carbon abatement program. Which is Ontario so Ontario now. is now in that situation. So this is so, the so-called <clears throat> federal backstop. This is the federal backstop. When we don't have a plan, the federal government's plan That's kicks right. in. Exactly. Kind of like the backstop in baseball, right? You, you throw the pitch, I you love the metaphor. It. You like that? I yeah. love that metaphor. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed, can we, Sheldon, can we bring that back up? By Ontario's cancelling its own cap-and-trade plan, the federal backstop kicks in, and unless I'm reading this completely incorrectly, which I don't think I am, the federal plan is actually far more expensive to each individual Ontarian's bottom line than the provincial plan exactly. would have been. Exactly. You're exactly reading it perfectly right. Because the, the dark bars are higher than the red bars. Yes. Okay, so then tell me why it makes sense. Uh oh, this is one of these questions. <laughs> this is one of these questions you're going to dodge. I can see it right Absol before I. No. <laughs> why does it make sense to cancel the cap and trade made in Ontario program? only to have a more expensive federal program come in in its stead? Well, <clears throat> that would be an excellent question for the Minister <laughs> of the Environment and the Minister of Energy. So certainly there were policy reasons behind uh, why these programs were cancelled. It was part of the electoral, the, the, the electoral platform. Mm -hmm. So when a, when a party runs for election on a specific promise, they tend to like to keep those promises. No, I get that. but. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if part of the mix here is that the province of Ontario is so confident that when it goes to court challenging the federal backstop, mm -hmm. the federal carbon tax, <clears throat> that that tax will be eliminated and therefore these expenditures will actually not be paid by Ontarians. Is that possible? I have no idea. I can't speculate on the outcome of even a reason why some programs are existing, let alone a court case that may take years to resolve. So I'm not, I might, might, you know, I've only been in the job six months. The crystal ball is still a bit cloudy. <laughs> you've only been in the job six months, but you've already <laughs> quite clearly learned what questions you should or should not answer. Okay, good. What kind of feedback have you had from this report? I've had very good feedback, actually from all sides. I think people understood it because it was clear. There is a few things going on in this report that are a little bit complicated. Um, I think really the, the piece that I'm most proud of is the fact that we were able to compare the, the chart that you just had up, the, the impact on, in, on average households under a cap and trade and under a federal backstop. We did an extra piece to that. We said, let's assume that the federal backstop goes in, and that's a reasonable assumption, mm -hmm. because the legislation has been passed. It is the really, law right it now. It is the law right now. There just needs to be a regulation put into effect, which will, apparently I, I hear will happen in November. Okay. And on January 1, the carbon backstop will apply. Um, <clears throat> we modeled a scenario whereby the federal government remitted those revenues raised from that backstop right back to Ontario households. And in fact, we found 80% of Ontario households would be better off under that scenario. They would actually get back more than they paid in, in, in carbon taxes. Let's understand that. If the, if, so if the federal backstop goes in, that's right. 80% of the people in Ontario will get a check directly from the federal government remitting to them? A notional check. I don't know what it's going to look oh, like. So it, like federal, it might be a break on your taxes. It might be a break. Right? It might be okay. a dividend. We don't know. And the government, the federal government hasn't specified exactly how it would do it, but they have suggested that that was one of the options they were looking at. And there have been a number of recent studies actually advocating for that option. We chose that option because the environment minister Canadian, federally had said this is something that you know we are we are considering. So we thought, okay. The backstop's probably going to come in. Right. I mean, the court case may or not be successful, and it may or may not happen before January 1st. We don't know that, but we do know the backstop will be there on January 1st, barring, you know, whatever happens in court. Mm -hmm. And we do know that there is a reasonable intention of the federal government to, to remit a dividend. So that's why we did that scenario. And the 80% of the people who would be better off under that scenario, <clears throat> do we have any sense about 
you know, who those people are, what their levels of income are, that kind of thing. We didn't do that sort of analysis. That's something that we may follow up with because those have been questions that I've been getting after doing this sort of explanation. All I can answer at the moment is these are folks that clearly aren't consuming as many carbon emitting or GHG emitting products mm -hmm. as others. So, for example, if you live, you know, you, the easy example is you live in downtown Toronto, you walk to work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe you, you live in a tent or something because maybe that's all you can afford in downtown Toronto. What I'm just being a little <laughs> facetious. Yes. Uh, coming from Ottawa, it's been a bit of a shock for me. Um, you're not emitting a lot of GHGs. You're not buying a lot of products that are emitting GHGs. You're probably going to be a net beneficiary of this sort of thing. And if you're somebody who's living maybe further afield, maybe needs to run a larger vehicle because you're on back roads, or maybe, you know, you, maybe you're living up north and you need to burn diesel fuel to generate electricity, mm -hmm you're probably going to get uh, on the other side of the ledger. So. Understood. Yeah. Does the financial accountability <clears throat> officer make a value judgment as to whether or not we're, we're, we're considering two different kinds of pollution abatement plans here That's in exactly essence, right? right? So yes. we've got the cap and trade plan, which Ontario brought in. We have a carbon tax, which the federal government's brought in. Yep. Do you make a value judgment on which format is better for reducing pollution in the environment? We don't do that. The only thing we'll make a value judgment on the only thing that I advocate for is transparency, budget and financial transparency. So anything else is somebody else's business, really. So Should, can we, can we I, uh, this is uh, at the risk of getting in the weeds here, but I really yeah. want people to understand the difference between the two options sure. that they're facing right here. Yeah, absolutely. I can talk about that. Sure. The difference between what a cap and trade plan, mm -hmm. which is now canceled, but what it intended to do versus what the federal backstop, the carbon tax plan that they have, is intended to do. Well, they're both intended to reduce GHG emissions, and they do it in two different ways. So the big difference between the two is in cap and trade. Uh, <clears throat> so effectively, the, the both things, the both both programs try to set a price on carbon. One of them, cap and trade, does it through a market mechanism, whereby those companies who are producing products that emit GHGs need to buy permits to allow or allowances to allow them to do that. And last year they bought $2 billion and worth of permits. That's right. And they bought $2 billion mm -hmm. worth of permits. The government mm -hmm. decides the total amount of permits that are available for auction. Mm -hmm. And then the price is set by those who participate in the auction. So that is that that has been, you may not want to use this adjective because I know you don't like adjectives, but that has been significant revenue to the Ontario government for the last couple of years. Those are fine adjectives to use. I'll even use those. You're too. okay with that? I'm okay with okay. that. Yes, it has been significant. And the government had promised to repurpose those revenues into programs, uh, investments, expenditures that would re have a reasonable chance of leading to reduction in GHGs. A cleaner environment. A cleaner environment. Okay. That's right. Good. So things like you know, promoting the use of electric vehicles or retrofitting your windows or upgrading your heating and ventilation systems and that sort of thing. Okay. So that's where the money was supposed to go. For cap and trade. For cap and trade. Yeah. So the money coming in from the auctions, companies buy these permits from the government, they send money to the government, the government puts them into a fund that goes and funds these other initiatives to reduce greenhouse gases. Gotcha. Okay. The other one. Federal tax, carbon tax, is simply a, a tax on those who are emitting GHG. So come, same sort of idea. If you are emitting a certain tonnage of GHGs every year in your production process, you will pay, I think it's $50 a ton of carbon equivalent for the purpose or the privilege of doing that. And then you will likely pass those costs along down the, down the chain to, to the end user who will pay more for, for their product. And obviously it's an incentive to pollute less because then you pay less pay tax. less tax. Exactly. Okay. And, you, and, and do you, you, you do not or you do have a view on which way is a better way to deal we, with pollution? What we did to answer that question is we don't have a view, but we did do some research and there isn't a view. There is actually no overarching consensus as to which way is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. they're, both, they're both effective for their own purposes. So if it's something that you want to run through and you want to have some control as a government over the expenditures, mm -hmm. Uh, then maybe cap and trade is a way to go. But it doesn't stop you from having control over the expenditures under a carbon tax scenario. There's no requirement to remit that carbon tax directly to households. You could take that money and put them into an expenditure account as well. So there are lots of, that's why it's, the, the, 
They're different mechanisms. They both can achieve the same outcome. That's also why, though, you may not want to say this, but I think I should sort of wrap this part up with a little bow by saying that's why a lot of conservatives don't like the carbon tax, because it is a tax that just goes into general revenues and isn't necessarily earmarked for environmental improvements. It's not entirely right. No? The, the okay. tax Good. does not go into general revenues. It goes into a, 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 a special fund. So the, the um, I don't remember it offhand, it's a greenhouse gas okay. fund of some sort. So it is, a, it is an earmarked a basket of money that is to be used for these projects. Okay, good. So, good but, but in cap and trade, um, governments do have a fair bit of influence uh, on the auction process because they're the ones that are issuing the permits. So gotcha. they can decide to issue more permits, to issue fewer permits, they can decide to issue free permits or uh, that sort of thing. So they have, even though it's an auction mechanism or market mechanism that sets the price, it's a bit of a managed market. So that very well may be why some conservatives, who those folks who prefer to see less government involvement in day-to-day -day activities may not like a cap and trade program as much as they might prefer a carbon tax, which is less, gov government basically sets a price, a tax on the carbon, and then they walk away. Okay. Yeah. Given that the provincial government, the new Doug Ford government has come out and said, we now believe the deficit for the province of Ontario mm -hmm. is $15 billion. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Not what the Liberals said before, That's not, right. what the, not even what the Auditor General said before. And not even what we said before. And not even you. They've, they've really got a very buoyant number out there. Or I guess it's the opposite of buoyant. They've got a very sinking <laughs> number out there it's at the bottom of the ocean. Their job mm -hmm. of balancing the books, based on your reporting, just got a whole heck of a lot more difficult, did it not? Well. Difficult is a judgment call, but certainly if your objective is to balance the books, yes, it did get more difficult. There is more money now that you're going to have to find, you know, there, there's a larger deficit you're going to have to find a way to fix. So, yes, the $15 billion, I think I should clarify, is uh, the number that came out of the commission or the, of inquiry about the, the financial transactions, etc. Our number was, was different last year, and we were, we're going to be updating our forecast uh, in November. So typically we provide a forecast twice a year and it's our own forecast based on what we observe in the economy, based on our own modeling, and uh, based on what the Auditor General determines our accounting rules around the pensions and around Fair Hydro. So we use that as our starting point, but then we provide our own independent assessment to the legislature. Okay, you got this whole thing going here because one member of the legislature asked you to do it. That's right. right. Andrea Horvath asked yep. you to look into the cap and trade impact. Mm -hmm. uh, can any member ask you to look into anything <clears throat> and do you have to do it? It's a very good question. So members can ask us to look into anything related to our mandate. Uh, committees can make requests of us. We can undertake work under our own volition, if you will. And the legislation does permit me to refuse to do work. So hmm. it's not something that, you know, again, I've only been in the job six months. I was at the parliamentary budget office for nine and a half years. In Ottawa. In Ottawa. So I've had a chance to, I've had a little bit of practice at this. Um, what we tend to do with requests that come in uh, that don't necessarily line up to our mandate is we'll work with the MPP or the committee to reformulate the question to get at the answer they want to get at, but something that we can, work that we can undertake. So <clears throat> I don't like to tell people we'll refuse requests, uh, but we will try to work with whoever is asking us to do the work to try to give them something that is useful for them. Understood. Well, this, I have to say, was useful. Good. Because I think we understand the situation, not only what you do, mm -hmm. but the whole cap-and-trade cost of the bottom line of the province and to households a lot better now. Good. Which is my way of saying thanks for coming in. Well, and, and thanks for having me, and I'm <laughs> glad to be able to provide that, you know, give me the opportunity to explain that. Not at all. How long's your term? My term is five years, renewable for another five if they decide they want me around that long. And uh, it's been great to be in Toronto. It's a great office. I walked in with a great team. They've done some amazing work. Uh, and I have to say that the relationship that this office has with the executive branch here is wonderful. It's mature which is not the case that it was in Ottawa. They gave you access to cabinet documents. We have they? access to cabinet yeah, documents. Yeah, no, we no. have regular input from the professionals in the, on, the, on the government side on our reports to make sure that we're not saying things that don't make sense. Um, and the minister's office does, does get a briefing in, a little bit in advance. Hmm. 
uh, to allow them to be prepared, but not, but not too long in advance. Super. So, no, well, we'll have you back. If you're going to be around five years, we'll have you back. <laughs> That's Peter Weltman. He's the Financial Accountability Officer for the province of Ontario. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.